at this time what is up people what is up what is up it's your boy jamil jude artistic director here at kenny leon's true colors theater and i'm always so happy to be joining you all on thursdays for the true colors podcast this is episode number 17 i think this is 17 uh man it's crazy i think i'm starting to lose count um you know you all thank you again for rocking with us thank you all for the people who uh think so much about us every week to donate we really do appreciate that today my guest is miss nicole brewer uh of the anti-racist uh theater and nicole and i have known each other for a long time long time she was actually one of the first actresses i ever had a chance to direct professionally and i'm sure we'll get into that um, so I'm really, really excited to have her on the podcast and depending on time, I'll speak a little bit about what's happening in Atlanta, what's happening in Georgia. You know, I love to, um, talk about the state of theater and of the arts and how all those things are connected, right? Like I, I believe that art is a political action and that anytime you put bodies on stage, especially black bodies, you are making a political statement. So art and politics are not divorced at all in our world. And of course, um, True Colors, we believe that we thrive at the intersection of artistic excellence and civic engagement. We gotta talk about what's happening in the world. Uh, so we'll do that a little bit later. Quick shout out, here's the shirt for the day. Uh, quick shout out to the cast of Schoolgirls of the African Mean Girls play for this really beautiful uh, shirt that they gave me. It is hot here and we don't have any power at my house so I am on my Wi-Fi. So I apologize if I'm a little slow at some point today, but I had to rock the t-shirt because it is hot in this house. All right, without further delay, y'all, let's bring on a brewer. On one more can. Right, um, y'all. Please wear your mask. I know I've been saying this. I've been telling y'all to stay at home or whatever. Uh, I'm really thankful for the notorious uh, KLB, as I affectionately call our mayor, uh, the city of Atlanta, Keisha Lance Bottoms, for taking the step to make sure that we can protect ourselves. Um, and I hate the fact that um, we have, a at the state level, people trying to infringe upon that. I won't spend time talking about their names and things like that, but uh, they hold uh, one of the highest seats in our state um, to work actively work against an order that will help us get back together as an artist that should piss us off as artists or as people who are love the art community find value in the art community y'all that should really upset all of us uh we should be so frustrated with not being able to gather and that someone's actively working against that nicole what's good we're gonna pause that uh sorry that we had a little technical difficulty We'll pause that. Don't worry. They, they've been getting that rant for 17 weeks. Uh, <laughs> we don't have to worry about that. We don't have to spend more time on that. How are you? Oh, my gosh. I was trying to donate. And so I didn't realize it was going to take me out and do all. I was like, no, no, no. Don't no worry. You can go to, yeah, you go to truecolorstheater.org to donate. We appreciate you. Girl, welcome to the podcast. Thank you, Jamil. So glad for the invitation to be in community with you. <laughs> yeah, absolutely, man. It's been a long time. This collaboration's been going for a long time. So thank you just uh, for doing that. Let's talk. People don't know you like I know you. Uh, tell them about your journey. Where are you from? And how, what's the quick, you know, two minute version of how you got to where you are? Uh, quick two minute down and dirty is I'm a Californian. And um, the work that I do anti-racist theater. Exactly. Exactly. Going up the W. Um, Anti-racist theater was just really born out of my experience of racism within the theater industrial complex and like, but loving telling stories, loving like the collaboration process and being in the rehearsal room and just being like fed by so many incredible um, artists. So I wanted to do something about it and began to ask those deep questions around how this could be done better. And it started with acting and it's like over the years, it's just spread when, and when people go, well, but do you do this for this sector uh, or do you do this for these people? And I'm like, yeah, I do. And so um, now my work has applications across the entire industry. 
And um, that's what I do. So I'm a director, an actor, only if people already know that I can act and will hire me because I'm, I'm out of the audition circuit. And um, educator, writer, writer activist is kind of the way that I see that. Um, and I don't know. I don't know what else I'm missing. No, man, I, th I think you're getting it all right. So, you know, we had the opportunity because I uh, uh, you were uh, one of the first actors that I ever had an opportunity to direct as a professional uh, in a production of For Color Girls that we did in D.C. But, to, um, you know, as I got to know you more, see you add those slashes um, after your uh, acting title has been just really, really amazing uh, to see. You talked about, you know, being in the rehearsal room and, and starting to see um, there's a better way for us to do that. Mm -hmm. And just talk a little bit about what was what was that process of navigating that with yourself? Because I think so many of us see something in the world and then want to be the change, but get a little nervous about taking that first step. What, what was that first step for you? Um, I think it was not liking desperation on me. Like I had really gotten to a part, a point in my acting career, um, especially after you transitioned out of arena along with Daniel which was the most lucrative time that I've, I've ever been in relationship with that theater, right? Um, that I was just desperate, desperate to work. I was doubting my capacity to be able to act or to get better at acting because I wasn't acting like that old cliche, like you work because you work. Um, and I just didn't like me as a desperate human being, right? Mm -hmm. Really kind of a pivotal moment for me was I had gone to an audition in Baltimore and I forget the theater. So I'm not even going to make something up and try to name it. There's only a few and like all of the DC, DMV black people were there and you had to come in and tell a story. And I remember afterwards, like I didn't get called back, but I had been sitting around talking to the other black folks and I went back up to the casting director and I was like, please just get me back in the room. Just give me one more chance. And that like moment of desperation uh, for work or to work or to like looking for this transformational moment in my career so people could, you know, see that I could do the work was something that I just never wanted to replicate again. And so like, what were these other systems and structures that I could be engaging in that would give me positional power and give me the opportunity to one, just relax and two, be able to open up my dramatic imagination around how it could be better, like how I could revision it. And that was at Howard. That was uh, at the time the chair Kim Bay called me and was like, come teach some classes at Howard. And I was like, fuck yes. <laughs> and just being able to be with black people and black bodies and to experiment um, with my students and not from a place where I knew that my blackness wasn't leading, but I got to be Nicole was so incredibly beneficial to me and completely invaluable around like how I'm at where I'm at now. Um, so yeah. yeah man, I, I, uh, I love that story, man. I, I love that feeling because uh, I think so many of us who, uh, BIPOC artists who are lucky enough to spend time in BIPOC spaces, um, that feeling of, oh, I get to walk in and just be Jamil. I don't have to be black director, black actor, and then get to know me and then you'll see the full Jamil. It's just like, oh, I'm gonna walk in fully knowing that the space accepts, accepts me for who I am on the outside um, and, is, and is, has brought me here to know who I am as a full person. Oh, uh, y'all, my guest today is Nicole Brewer. Uh, we're talking about building an anti-racist theater. Nicole, so talk about that, you know, here you are now at Howard, remind our viewers, you did not have an HBCU undergrad experience, correct? No, I did. I went to Howard. Oh, as an undergrad? I thought you I thought you only went there at, at, to teach. No. Oh, it's your, I, it's I, your grad degree. That's... Oh, God. Yeah, that's where I, I went to the white institute. I, was, I, thought, I, thought, I thought I remember you from Ohio or something like that, coming from a grad school in, in the <laughs> Midwest. I thought that's what no, I was. my graduate school was Midwest. It was yeah, okay. Northern what... University. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But Howard is where I got my undergrad. Oh, okay, 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 okay. Well then mm -hmm. let's just skip let's skip over that question then. Because I was talking <laughs> I was gonna talk about what is that nurturing, but what did you have to well maybe you still can answer it. Was there anything that you felt like you had to unlearn 
um, in going back into that space or the first time that you appeared at Howard? Uh, did you have to unlearn some, some things um, that allowed you to become your best self now? Oh, yeah. I would say um, you and I are the same generation, and so we are on that cusp of uh, incredible, extraordinary master teachers, but people who would just, like, shame the hell out of you and people who would... Um, they would just embarrass you in front of everybody and not think twice about it. And there really wasn't a spectrum. Either you rose to their bar and you met it and exceeded it, or you were like invisible. And that was with love and respect. That was my fire at Howard as an undergrad. And so I'm talking about like Mike Malone. I'm talking about Dr. Sherylman, um, Berryman. I'm talking about Johnson. I'm talking about, you know, Reggie Ray. Uh, who was like my nemesis, <laughs> oh my God, as a, as a young person, right? As like an 18 year old, I just didn't understand the brilliance that, that was Reggie. And so that is the, what I had to unlearn. I had to unlearn that to be in relationship with people and then I couldn't put myself above them. You hurt my feelings. But also, when he, but also, we good. Sorry, sorry, sorry. My wife pulled up. My phone automatically connects to her Bluetooth. So the podcast. Was <laughs> Black magnificence. Um, I'm so here for that. So yeah. So that's just kind of what it was. Like I had to. I had. I really had to to stop putting trauma on black bodies because that was no longer our reality. And I understand why my old professors did it um, and what their world was, but I, but I didn't need to continue that in order to be an effective, uh, you know, educator, teacher, facilitator of learning. Yeah, man. You know, I've been, I've been thinking a lot. We've had some conversations over the last uh, three weeks or so here in the Atlanta acting community. And um, as we navigate, not just a cultural shift, but also that generational shift of what is healthy. I think we better understand just like what mental health looks like and feels like and how you can preach that and practice that for other people. Um, you know, there are things that we're going to have to unlearn. And I'm really, really thankful for, um, which feels, I feel so old saying it, but like a new generation of artists that are challenging, I think, you know, us in our in that sandwich generation to rethink what um mentorship could look like and what challenging someone could look like um talk nicole if you don't mind about increasing your platform as an advocate here you are as a professor you know you're you're advocating for your students and and, and maybe even in ways in your own life but now people are uh, coming to you to uh, you know advocate for the field at large mm -hmm. can you just talk about what what has been that process in assuming that because it is a role it is a it is it becomes like a it becomes a thing you have to carry on uh can you just talk a little bit about what that was like for you yeah i am i'm where i am today because of so many people who poured into me and um i just gotta take a breath and poured into me generously and poured into me you know, love as an act of discipline. Um, people who, when I like tried to slide through with some old sly shit or some whatever was like, not today, boo, not today. Make a decision. How are you going to show up and who are you going to be? Not just in this moment, but also past this moment that I'm so grateful for. And I'm so grateful for the work of the generations that came before me who have been like, you know, basically trying so hard to have their voices heard, to have um, this work be on the level that it is right now, to be accepted, or at least people are turning to listen to it at this level. Um, and so anyway, I carry that with me. It, I always want to talk about the people who knew what the struggle was for me and who knew what, who know, who know what the struggle is, period, right? Um, that I don't also want to like gloss over the retaliation that I faced, um, the lack of jobs that I've been able to get once I made the decision to like do this work. And for me, the decision 
was made easier when I looked at, I did everything I was supposed to do, right? That, that like narrative that they fed us, get those degrees to, you know, work hard, be likable, you know, exhaust yourself, say yes to everything but your own needs. Like I did all of that. And I became like this desperate, yucky human being. And I failed, right? I did all of that at a standard that I, I would think was good, um, if not excellent, and I failed. And so really what happened was a job that I had um, here in Washington, DC, and I was so excited about having this job and it was stable for me. And there were a lot of nutritious people within the organization, but not the, or not the department I was working in. And my health really tanked. Like depression was out of control. My weight was out of control. Like something's going on with my digestive system. Like I just, I just was on the verge of like continuing this path and shorten my lifespan or do something radical and change. And I wish that that was all on my own in terms of like understanding that. But what really happened was like, there was a falling out and I wasn't hired back at that job anymore. And that space gave me time to really, again, continue to be radical, to push my own work. Um, and the more that I stepped into my full authentic self at any given point, like what that is, I don't know who I'm going to be six months from now, but like the more that I did that, what I began to notice was more people were attracted to that kind of energy. They were attracted to that light, not because they wanted it for themselves, but because it gave them permission to let their own light shine. And so, um, you know, that's how the work just kind of continues for me off of this basis of the more that I can model for people that stating your needs is important, that like putting boundaries around your life is important, that, you know, um, bringing your opinions to the space and really working in a collaborative way is, is healthy and nutritious and also important um, when facilitated properly that I've been able to work, 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 and work. Um, so it's, it's, quite, it's kind of interesting. That's not what I set out to do. I just kind of set out to like figure out how the hell I could not be killing myself and like giving back 10 years of my life or 15 years of my life to an industry that could, wasn't concerned about me, an industry that was, is very much, right, because we still haven't seen this transformation, that is very much um, extract and discard, right? We can't even talk about recycling. It's just so extractive for people in that moment and then discarding those people and picking the next one in line um, to do the same thing too. Mm. I feel like I went off. <laughs> oh, no. all, all of it speaking to just to how we how we start that process of rethinking, reevaluating, reevaluating, and shaping a new uh, a, a new future for for our industry. Y'all, uh, today my guest is Nicole Brewer uh, of Anti Racist Theater. Nicole is a DC artist, multi hyphenate um, theater maker, and we're really excited. Uh, she and I will be uh, co presenting the opening session of the AFTA 2020. Uh, conference next week. Uh, next week, actually, at this time. Um, so, you know, I'll, I'll talk about it a little bit later, but we got to talk about what's going to happen with the podcast next week. But, um, you know, so, also a quick shout out to anybody who is donating. Thank you, guys. We see that. We see you. We appreciate you. Nicole, one of the things that you uh, talked about was that, you know, sometimes people, um, people looked at you differently once you started stepping into your own light. One, I'm really excited about the, what you were saying about your light leading and then your light attracting, right? Like, I think more people need to hear that, that you being one, your full self, bring your full self, showing up as your full self. It, while it may detract some people, it's going to lead you, one, into the right direction, and then people are going to be drawn to that, too, and want to work with you. Um, you find yourself working and your work is getting more work. Can you just talk about, like, okay... What does that process look like when you are being asked, your services are being solicited in that way? What is that initial like relationship uh, with the client? What does that early work uh, look like? A lot of it looks like telling people that I really try to center not harming them. And, and that's important because I'm coming off of all of the work of equity, diversity, inclusion, and access. And in that time, while it has given people vocabulary and awareness, done a lot of harm to the BIPOC community. So 
um, in terms of like having to be in spaces and whole white learning um, and offering up their body and their, their, their spirit again and again and again. And so I have to tell people, I don't do that. And they don't necessarily believe it, you know? Um, and I have a lot of questions, believe it or not, where people are kind of just like, well, I don't think the BIPOC folks want to be in this training with us. And I'm always like, people have the right to say no, thank you. But just can they try what I'm offering first? And then if they decide, you know, I'm going to opt out of this, then they opt out. And I've never had a BIPOC person opt out of my training. I've had, I've had a white man opt out of my training. <laughs> um, but I think it's really important that I'm just like, I center Black people and I center Indigenous people. And so when I see you coming out of that framework to make it about you, I just call you in and I remind you that this this space that we're holding together isn't about that right so I think that that's important that I'm like saying what my values are I'm not assuming that anybody knows and that my work is a mixture of my experiences my degrees my um you know experience as an educator I've, I've literally taught every grade <laughs> k through 12 and then I've taught you know on the collegiate level for uh, I think the last 12 years, something like that, last 12, 13 years as well. Um, so, you know, there's a spectrum for me around engagement. And I think that with these kind of tender conversations about racism, and then people develop one, like seeing their own accountability in the work, and then two, like developing their own anti racist theater ethos, um, that we, the space has to be able to hold the spectrum of differences is the way I'm looking at it. And I think the BIPOC and the global majority community has its work to do around the way that some folks are continuing to gatekeep white supremacy and continuing to harm folks in the beloved community. And white people have their work to do around their accountability and the myths that they still believe that um, generate fear that keep them from fully engaging with all of their positional power and all their skin privilege towards our liberation, right? So, yeah. Yeah, talk about it, man. Let's talk about the work. And, you know, I feel like over the last four or four weeks, you know, well, let's just say like, I, this hit a critical point, uh, mm -hmm. right? And then everyone wanting to call themselves in or being called in, whether they did it um, willingly or kicking and screaming, um, are now having to face this. But I think there's so much fear um, in approaching it at the beginning and then moving people. One thing that I've been thinking about, and um, you know, you and I, we share some ideas about what we want to talk about it at the uh, Daniel Banks, shout out to Daniel Banks, um, you know, he, he put that idea in my head about like, well, what's, what's the fear? And then what's ultimately to gain? Like how, mm -hmm. you know, yes, let's acknowledge it because we can't move past if we don't talk about what, what we all personally are holding on to that we're afraid that we might lose. But like, mm -hmm. let's talk about the world of abundance that we may be able to live in if we allow ourselves um, to go there. Uh, Nicole, do me a favor, uh, play this game with me. Close your eyes okay. and think about a radically reinvented American theater and then share with us, what do you see? Uh, I see Black women. Uh, I absolutely see Black women and their visions and their voices being appreciated, um, being uplifted, being supported like 360 degree support um, and for their brilliance to be able to be the mechanism that is um, driving this change. So, yeah. yeah. All right, right. So like, you know, I start the process and I close my eyes too. Then I open them because I, I love seeing people like smile when they start to vision you know and like that's been like one of the fun things as again like i said since we've been uh asking that question here on the podcast it's just like man like that's the thing that we can get to right like that's the shit that like you know i want to go and work for every day to be like all right i want to go make that uh make that that work uh possible mm -hmm. 
Y'all, my guest today is Nicole Brewer at the Anti-Racist Theater, and we're just here. We're talking right now. We're talking about radically reinventing the American theater and the anti-racist work that she does can help us do that. Uh, Nicole, you know, you talk about uh, BIPOC people, Black, Indigenous people of color, for those, uh, for anybody who's unfamiliar with that term, um, you know, feeling like they have to carry some of that emotional weight uh, when it comes to these uh, conversations around equity, diversity, inclusion, and access. Um, have you done any of this type of training just specifically in BIPOC spaces? Um, and if so, what does that look like? If not, how could you imagine what that kind of work uh, could potentially look like? Yeah, well, I would say because Howard was my fertile soil as an educator now, not as a, a student. So I worked there for seven and a half years in the theater department. That, that was me figuring it out, you know, with my beloved community and that diaspora of blackness um, that was there. So yes, I have. And as I continue to go out um, in the world and just be met by incredible, incredible people who are doing different works, like you brought Daniel Banks's name into, into this conversation. And then I uplift Carmen Morgan, who is an incredible mentor for me, um, but also Nigel Porter and also like, you know, just, all these other folks who are teaching me how to be held, which is important. And, I, and, I, and, and that part, right, of like, let me support you. Let me pour into you in the way that I see you pouring into these other communities. And then me combating that narrative of having to be a strong Black woman and not need that support, right? Um, really kind of holding up for myself how I can facilitate that for other people around, you know, undoing this narrative of weakness, um, of vulnerability, of, of being able to be in community with folks. And sometimes that's little pockets of sisterhood. Um, sometimes that's just, you know, being a part of a larger community across gender. Sometimes it's me being an ally to an experience that is quite different and outside of my own. So, you know, wanting to just kind of lift that up, that for me, I got to have, so an analysis that I recently came to around like engaging people in this work and whether or not I choose to go forward is around, am I as transformed by this experience that I know that you're going to be, mm. right? It's helpful for me because it's not just about currency in terms of money, but it's also in terms of like, what am, what's being nourished in me that allows me to continue with this work right that recharges me or makes me have this huge ass smile on my face like when i think about black women <sighs> running shit in the forefront and completely acknowledged because we already run shit but like acknowledge that it is happening and supported in that way <laughs> you know um, we normally save this to the end but it does feel like a natural segue uh, we've been celebrating Black women storytellers all season long as part of our She Grio season. Um, and I want to just give this space, since we here we are, let's talk about Black women running the world. Who are some of the Black women, the Black women storytellers who have had an impact on you, um, you know, becoming the amazing person you are today? Well, I, I want to say, okay, so there was a name that popped in my head, but then you finished your question, and I was like, does that mean it's got to be in the past a long time ago? But Okay, so I want to like big shout out to um, Lady Dane Figueroa Adidi. Lady Lady Dane is. I saw her work at the Alliance here in D.C. Um, and I may not be saying the name of that theater quite right because I get it confused with the one in Atlanta. Yeah, but um, she did Clytemestra, which is a play that she wrote and performed. And oof, <laughs> when I talk about like a, a spiritual moment of transcendence and just brilliance, yeah. And like that is someone who um, I just want to be around. And I had the I had the incredible honor of like being on a panel um with her in December and I remember sitting next to her and I was like oh my god I just want to touch you I just you know but we don't know each other but I just want you know so 
it's people to me like that whose activism is so beautifully and elegantly um, intertwined with their artistry. People who are unapologetic about how they're showing up and um, still have joy, still have this magnanimous like aura of joy around them. Um, their resilience is captivating to me. And so, you know, that's people um, that I want to be around and whose work inspires me and like, you know, nourishes me. And I'm sure I could like list a whole bunch of other people, but my mind is kind of going break blank as I. That's, and I, I, I do this, I've done this now for 17 weeks and I, I feel like I have like flame questions and then I end up like, so what's your favorite color? You know, like I end up like, <laughs> uh -huh. And it's like, dang, man, I'm, I was trying to do some hard-hitting journalism, and <laughs> I threw up a couple of softballs. Uh, y'all, <laughs> and we are uh, both uh, honored to be uh, co-presenting the opening plenary session for the At The Conference uh, a little bit later uh, this month, uh, next week, I guess. Uh, Nicole, you know, anytime, um, you know, we get an opportunity to speak, we, the universal we or whatever, I imagine that. You know, we all approach it with some level of reverence, and, uh, and you know, it's, it's always an honor to to speak and address a crowd. In this case, we are speaking to a national, if not international, body of mm. educators and some in your peers. Um, for me, my, my former professors, you know, <laughs> in a case possibly uh, one or two. Um, can you just talk about like what what are your first steps in in, in, in accepting a role like that, what are the things that you like want to keep in mind um, when you look to give a keynote like that? Mm. Am I speaking the truth? And, and, and can I stand behind what it is that I have to say? Mm. Um, and I feel exactly as like you were talking about, like really honored to, to be asked to lend my voice knowing that I'm speaking from my eye and my experience, but also that this is a moment that will, that people will interpret or hear as a larger, like I'm speaking for a larger cohort of people. Um, so I wanna be clear about that. But for me, edu the educational system has perpetrated countless harms on Black, Indigenous, and POC folks on the global majority. And there needs to be a reckoning around that. And that reckoning is, for me, around accountability. That reckoning is around skill sets that need to completely be um, uh, attended to is kind of the way that I'm looking at it, because I feel like, you know, people's racial conflict competence is at zero. And that has to be unacceptable as we're moving in this anti-racist educational world. You can't be at zero with your skill set. You, you have to be at an eight, nine, or a 10, if that's our scale, or a zero to 10. Um, and so, you know, turning to do that work and re-envisioning that work. And so for me, because we're specifically speaking at ATHA, I'm, you know, talking about these particular cohort of folks. And... Um, that's what I hope to bring next week is my truth that isn't mired in like being too stuck in the past, but just like naming the facts full stop. Yeah. And also then giving the charge of this extraordinary exercise that you did with me around the vision and around the possibility that we know to be true. I know it to be true because I've been doing it for years now and it works. It's a survivable event. <laughs> but I'm not the only one. There are other people who have been toiling for um, work that is equitable, work that is responsive, uh, work that is um, not about engaging in, in harm and reproducing harm for folks. So yeah, it's time for higher education to kind of own their role in creating incredible barriers for us, like, I'm sitting here right now talking to you with, I think, about $134,000 in student loan debt, but with data that backs up the fact that I was never meant to work consistently enough in the field to ever be able to repay that money. That's problematic. 
you know, I sit here in front of you as someone who has up until recently adjunct their entire life uh, in my career, so to speak, and never made enough money to even begin to tend to that impact. But I'm in service to educating more and more people. So it's like really kind of even revisioning for me on a higher education level, our, uh, that organization as a large organization, not AFTA, but the organization of higher education, uh, relationship to money, relationship to how they are budgeting their money and how they are seeing money in terms of a currency and a connector between them and these so-called communities that they just can't find. Get trained enough people or edu educated enough or talented enough to bring into their departments, and also how they are looking at the salaries of the global majority folks who do come into these predominantly white institutions. Like, where's the radical transparency around how you were paying them based across social location and not some ridiculous ass, you know, chart of payment um, that can't necessarily exceed someone who's been there uh, three years longer than you, but is racist and harming folks. And then you got to come in there and teach them how to not do that, right? Like, so where is that um, kind of reckoning, I think, that needs to be happening? in higher education. And I'm so glad that you are talking about this because, you know, often it's something that escapes me. I did not uh, pursue um, higher education after my four-year degree. Um, so I, I, and it wasn't until the tw towards the end of my college experience that I uh, really stumbled into the theater department. Uh, so I, I feel slightly removed to, to that, but have been in, you know, in community with people who have had that experience. And I think that that's that's a thing that we just we really just have to get down to. And you spoke on it from so many different uh, perspectives. One, we got to find a way to address um, the income issues that are here, right? Like we are, we were, we were telling people, it felt like um, a generation of artists that went to uh, graduate school from the mid to late nineties to probably, you know, 20, 20, you know, uh, but maybe even at least until 2012 or whatever, like, hey, you got to get an MFA, you got to go to a certain number of schools, um, because that's the type of work that people want to see on our stages. That's how you get opportunities to um, leadership positions and things like that. But what we then put out is that we put out people who would not even be able to pay off their debt in a reasonable timeline. So people who are uh, stuck in a debt rut and also we've continued more inequity because it is harder for people of color to get in some of these institutions. So if that's the only way that you can gain these positions of power mm -hmm. and people of color can't get to them. And just because you have that degree does not necessarily mean you're gonna get the opportunity. So now pe black people, black BIPOC people included are jumping through smaller and smaller hoops to get you fewer opportunities because these theaters aren't actually given those opportunities in an equitable way. So we've just, higher education is complicit in how we got here. And we have to find a way to address that because they are, whether they want to claim that space or not, um, initial gatekeepers in, in, in this field. Yeah. Come on with that word, Jamil. <laughs> yeah. Man, you know, it's real easy once you all just start feeding it. And I was like, oh, okay, well, I'm going to put this thing together. I'm going to say this one. <laughs> I love the smaller and smaller hoops. <laughs> yeah. So you, real. And, and, and I'm seeing it. And, and I think, too, one, one thing that's been important for me, and I know this is your interview, so I'll stop talking about myself here, but um, it, I found myself both working in predominantly white spaces the entirety of my career until I moved to True Colors and recognizing that, you know, it's gonna have to be a yes and, right? Like uh, BIPOC people are, while I believe our spaces are sacred, um, I can only speak at True Colors, our resources are not uh, unlimited and that I can't hire every single black artist that wants to uh, participate in, uh, in the world. I can continue to make that and expand that as open as possible, um, but there is a, finality to the resource. We can speak about abundance and saying that there are more ways, but I believe in paying people, you know, and using those 
the resources, right? You got to do that. Um, yeah. But so artists are going to have to work both in uh, BIPOC led and serving organizations and these other organizations, predominantly white institutions. So we really got to start thinking about just what is wrapping it up in care, but also holding uh, one another accountable uh, to that. Um, if I may, Nicole, I want to ask you this question about um, speaking to that reckoning that needs to happen in higher education. Um, how do you see holding up well, you, you, you started to answer it a little bit about BIPOC people, maybe not a perception, maybe from white people that BIPOC people may not want to uh, participate in your workshops. Um, how do you see yourself holding up the BIPOC professors and the adjuncts and uh, people who have had to kind of work so hard to help these organizations change, yet they're so slow to do it? Uh, while also holding to task, like, you know, how do you navigate that balance? Yeah. Well, what's really great about this is um, all of the organizations that I've worked with up to this point, um, I just kind of helicopter in and lay out a, a very broad framework. I always say you all are the experts of your community, right? Here are some thoughts. And so it's easier for me to, in terms of this power dynamic, to be on the outside going, but have you thought about this? What's your anti-racist you know, theater ethos in terms of your hiring committee? Like what exactly is your anti-racist rubric that you all are holding each other to task to so that you're not be beholden to this, we hired the best candidate who happens to be another white person to these positions specifically in higher education as well, where, well, not actually, in the theater industrial complex, where there aren't necessarily terms to how long someone's going to be, where they're going to be, you know? And in Washington, D.C., and it's a few blocks away from my house, you know, I think about, you know, Arena Stage and like how long, oh, this is my son being ridiculous. Um, Lennox, I can hear you, boo. <laughs> OK, um, so, you know, like how long Molly has been in that position and I don't, I'm not bringing up Molly to talk about any Molly stuff. I'm just saying we have to think about how the tenure of how long people are in the positions that they're in who we hire. Like there is a real consequence to hiring folks without that anti-racist analysis around how that's going to continue to impact that organization or the work of that organization towards the transform transformation of becoming anti-racist, right? Um, I'm also one, there was something that you said that I, I want to kind of circle back to, which is I am all about our collective liberation. Uh, I think that's another reason why my work is so widely accepted is because I'm not, even though I center Black people and I center Indigenous people in terms of how I'm facilitating, I understand very clearly that we all have a role to play. So I'm also not a champion of saying that white people need to sound like a day of absence, they need to disappear. <laughs> um, but I am saying that there has to be a really clear and deep analysis around what their role is. And also bringing to them this idea that we as global majority folks, we don't want the same thing that they want. So like in their mind, they go, oh, in this calculation, it means I'm out and Nicole's in. And that's the only way that that equation computes. And it's like, nah, because I don't necessarily want to be in and trying to like push this thing forward in the way that you would do it because that's not my culture or that's not my value system or that's not how I roll, right? So that becomes important too, to like letting them know, I don't want what you want. <laughs> and you have to be able to vision that or accept that. that it's going to look different because I, I just don't want to roll in a way that I think is harmful to not just my community, but to the environment and to future generations, right? So um, that part is important too, just in terms of the work and like how it shows up a little differently in response to the different communities that have, you know, come together. Yeah, man, you know, <laughs> we'll go out on that. Like, uh, I don't want to do more work. Like you got to do your job too, right? Like keep your role. I don't want your job. Um, what's to fear, but like really let's talk about what's to gain in your role 
inside that. Y'all, if y'all want more of these flames, y'all gonna have to just register for the after conference. We're not gonna give you the whole talk uh, right here. My guest today has been Nicole Brewer. Um, my friend, I'm happy to call you a friend, um, but really just a, 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 um, a change agent in the field. A lot of the work she's been doing with anti-racist theater has been just amazing. Um, Nicole, you know, people who want to know more about the work and how to, you know, get you to come speak to them, let's take them out on how can they get in contact with you? Um, the quickest and easiest way is through my website, which is my name. It's Nicole mbrewer.com nicole mbrewer.com and there's like a little form that says contact me so people can reach me that way good guys nicole mbrewer.com that's the way to get at her um but uh, for all the folks who are going to be at the at the conference check us out next thursday when we're doing our thing nicole thank you very very much for joining me today it's always so good to see your face and i'm sure we got another call um before i'll talk so i'll see you again soon okay great thank you so much bye Bye-bye. Guys, man, I'm, uh, you know, I love these things, man. I love having um, you all join us every week on Thursdays. It's just been just a blessing. It's been uh, my little spark of joy. Uh, we talk about joy and pain. And, yes, we're navigating this moment where, especially for BIPOC folks, we are having to dredge up a lot of pain of past experiences to navigate through that. And that's not to minimize the experiences of, of our white colleagues who are probably also going through their own pain of uh, racial reckoning, of having to understand the ways in which they've been complicit, how we've all been complicit um, in this thing. Uh, so I'm just really excited um, to be working through this with you guys and just spending some time um, to uh, my mama. What's my mama saying? <laughs> I'm blessed to call you son. Mom, stop. I'm trying to work here. Damn, mom. Um, but thank you, God. I love my mother. She has been embarrassing me uh, since 1986, and here she is doing it again. But I'm so thankful. Yeah, okay. I'm going to go back to, and while I start to start smiling um, as my mom is on IG, uh, I just want to talk quickly again. You know, I mentioned it in my rant earlier. Let's just go back uh, before I end this day. You know, you know, wearing a mask does not make you a bad person, right? Like, I don't know why this has been politicized. But as a leader of an organization, I'm, I can only say that when we do this, it allows us to get back to the art making, right? Like, we can't, we can't continue to act like our way of life is not going to be impacted by these decisions. So I'm just looking forward um, to having these types of conversations, especially in our state, where Georgia is so poor at giving uh, funding, Georgia, the state of Georgia, is, it's not great at giving arts funding. So we have people in positions that are using their position of power to keep art from happening. Like they're taking away opportunities and ending unemployment benefits because so, and so many artists and others, but so many artists specifically, especially performing artists, are out of work. You are uh, removing people's opportunities to prevent measures, to put measures in place that will eventually lead towards us being able to go back to work. You are uh, not funding our organizations and yet you are gonna lean on artists to then tell and champion this story, right? Like it is what we do. We can't wake up and not want to be storytellers. Uh, so today it just hurts me just, just as an artist, uh, just before anything else that we have so many people working so actively to keep art from happening. But hey, y'all, we're gonna continue to connect. We're gonna continue to circumnavigate through all this BS. Uh, and we're gonna continue to um, be a space and a home for people who are care about black stories and how we share them. Uh, so just thank you all for uh, rocking with us, for being here with us at True Colors and doing all of what you do. Um, I ask that you continue to take care of yourselves, find those moments of joy, continue to celebrate the black women storytellers in your life. Uh, check it out next week. Next week, we got a little special surprise for you all. Um, Nicole and I are going to be delivering that speech to Atha. So there will be some special guests here uh, for the True Colors podcast. So look forward to that. Yes, I know I have loved seeing your shining faces uh, every Thursday at one o'clock, but there'll be some new faces here for you all at Thursday. And I believe it's going to be just an amazing conversation. So look forward to that, y'all. Thanks for rocking with me. I got 
the power seems like it's coming on and it's uh, throwing off my alarm system. So I'm going to end it here. But thank you all. Be safe. Wear a mask. Stay home if you ain't got to go out. Love y'all. Talk to you next week. Well, no, I won't talk to you next week. Uh, you will talk to some other people. I'll talk to y'all in two weeks. All right, rock on, y'all.